Pinpointing the exact place where humanity took its first steps seems like a pipe dream, but not to the scientists at the Garvin Institute of Medical Research in Sydney, Australia. Not only do they believe they've discovered the true birthplace of humanity, but their findings suggest that everything we thought we knew was wrong. Scientists uncover strange truth about where humans really came from. No one can really say when humanoids first split off from early primates. We do know they eventually evolved into the precursor to our Homo sapien ancestors, Homo erectus. These ancient humans roamed the Earth long before the existence of our recorded history. As such, records of this distant past are few and far between. Fossils, however, have served to bridge some of these historical gaps, leaving scientists with a somewhat convincing picture of how the human race as we know it came to be. One theory, the multi-regional hypothesis, asserts that the first humans originated in a single location and subsequently migrated across the globe. Once there, these early humans mixed with existing humanoid populations to become the modern humans of today. Yet the most popular and widely accepted hypothesis among scientists remains the out-of-Africa theory. The OOA model echoes the multi-regional hypothesis in the belief that humans migrated from one location, Africa, yet instead of mixing with existing populations, these humanoids replaced them entirely. For decades, these theories were simply educated guesses based on existing physical evidence. But with the introduction of advanced DNA testing around the turn of the 21st century, scientists were able to trace their hypotheses back to a single individual. Known as Mitochondrial Eve, this prehistoric woman lived at a time when the human population was only about 10,000 strong. And while she wasn't the first woman on Earth or the Eve from the Bible, her DNA is present in nearly every human today. Pinpointing humanity's earliest common ancestor was nothing to bat an eye at, yet scientists were more concerned with what else Eve's DNA implied. Not only had we all descended from a single individual, but that individual had come from a familiar place. Africa. Along with lending legitimacy to the OOA theory, this revelation allowed scientists to begin plotting the paths these early humans likely took out of Africa. The first migration is believed to have occurred between 60,000 and 80,000 years ago, when humans made their way across the expanses of Asia. From there, they made their way southeast around 45,000 years ago, reaching places like Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, and even Australia. About 5,000 years later, humans began migrating north into Europe. By about 15,000 years ago, humans who'd settled in Asia began making their way across the Pacific to North America. Those here then dispersed across the continent, with some even migrating as far as South America. Yet while human origins in Africa have been generally accepted by the scientific community, the question remains as to where exactly on the continent we first popped up. After all, the total landmass of Africa is bigger than Canada, the US, and China combined. But geneticist Vanessa Hayes was up to the challenge. Together with her team from the Garvin Institute of Medical Research, Hayes was about to do what no one had done before. Discover where humans truly came from. They began by collecting more than 1,200 DNA samples from Southern Africans, including those that lived in indigenous communities. Hayes and her team were looking to isolate the zero lira lineage, also known as the genetic code that carries back to Eve. Even after taking the zero lira second sub-branches into account, the geneticists were able to trace the lineage back to a region of Southern Africa. More specifically, the DNA samples all pointed to a territory within Botswana. Using fossil records and other prehistoric evidence, the team was able to isolate a large chunk of what is now the Kalahari Desert. Today, the area is nothing more than a stretch of sand and dust in ancient times, it was nothing of the sort. Instead, this area was known as Lake Makgadikgadi, an enormous body of water roughly the size of New Zealand, that became a rich wetland around 200,000 years ago. And according to Hayes and her team, this was the place Homo sapiens first came to be. For 70,000 years, this fertile region provided humankind with the perfect environment for both growth and sustainability. Yet as climate change began to take its toll, the continent began to change dramatically. As new rains made formerly barren plains spring forth with lush plant life, New corridors for travel became available to these early humans. 
This led to a great global migration around 60,000 to 80,000 years ago, the rest is history. Yet not everyone is convinced that Hayes's findings are the absolute truth, as some scientists believe that examining solely the zero lira lineage leaves a narrow view of mankind's origins. In fact, another study of male inherited Y chromosomes showed that humans first appeared in West Africa instead. So while Hayes's conclusions offer a convincing argument for humanity's origins, her findings stand only as a piece of an ever-expanding puzzle. Yet with each additional discovery, we inch ever closer to finally unlocking the truth about our history. Scientists also find that the more information we collect, the more we realize that we don't know. But experts are getting closer. Dominic Papineau, a geologist at the University College London, had his sights set on likely the biggest human origin question of all time, one that could either make or break Hayes's hypothesis. Though many tried and failed before him, Dominic wondered if he could determine the origin of life on Earth. He looked to a peculiar region of his native Canada for that answer. In 2008, he planned a trip to the Nevoegetic Suprachrystal Belt. Scientists have previously investigated this site, which was a hotbed of volcanic activity long ago. But rather than search for fossils, Dominic was on the hunt for something on the smaller side, a subject you could only see through a microscope. His expedition wouldn't revolve around any kind of missing link, as Dominic hoped to find an organism that appeared billions of years before humanoid life. Of course, such a simple and tiny thing would be unlikely to leave behind much evidence. The Nevoegetic Belt, located in the far regions of Quebec, stands out even to the untrained eye. Layered iron formations striped across the landscape, with quarter-sized swirls dotting certain rocks. Dominic and his UCL colleagues approached them, hammers in hand. These mineral sections set off an alarm in Dominic's head. They resembled structures formed by microscopic creatures in underwater vents, so he couldn't help but make a connection. The geologist excitedly smashed the specimen right off the cliff. Dominic's team of geologists and researchers repeated that process dozens of times as they amassed over 100 pounds of rocks. However, they couldn't tell whether or not these samples added up to anything just by looking at them. Only close analysis could prove or refute Dominic's theory. He took the rocks to the Carnegie Institute for Science in Washington, D.C., where researchers sliced them into cross-sections and took a look at their composition. The microscope revealed filaments running throughout the stone. Papineau and his colleagues felt almost certain that only organisms, not any kind of natural erosion, could have created such a pattern. But that wasn't the most striking aspect. These remnants dated back sometime between 3.77 and 4.28 billion years ago. Assuming the geologists hadn't made any errors, they realized they might have discovered proof of the earliest life on the planet. Papineau knew he had to tread lightly. There were plenty of scientists before him who made such a bold claim and, once proven wrong, found their careers and reputations in shambles. Still, he figured they had a strong case. Dominic proposed that these microbes could have harvested nutrients from the iron and chemical reactions happening throughout the region. In a way, they could be very similar to the organisms found thriving in toxic deep-sea vents. And such ancient forms of life would have needed to be hardy and adaptable, too. Dominic's testing dated them to the Hadean Eon, a time where the planet was filled with storms and eruptions, it was basically mortar for billion years. Then, as environmental conditions became less hostile, these microbes could have slowly evolved into all manner of species. Dominic stood by his theory, though many in the geological community dismissed his claims. This was no surprise, as there has always been disagreement about the origin of biological life. Charles Darwin speculated that a particular chemical reaction in a warm little pond could have caused it. But many competing theories have popped up since. In the 1990s, paleobiologist J. William Schopp announced he'd discovered 3.5 billion year old bacteria in Australia. His peers, however, soon accused him of exaggerating his claims just so he could make history. And he wasn't even the debate's most controversial figure. Some thinkers believe that life traveled to Earth on a meteor, though most scientists hotly reject this explanation. In fact, back in the 1600s, a cosmologist named Giordano Bruno was burned at the stake for popularizing such a claim. 
With dissension on all sides, Dominic continues to examine his findings. He knows that their investigation affects far more than just a group of bickering biologists. It could mean everything for the future of humanity. If life could exist in such harsh conditions on Earth, then it might not be so out of the question for organisms to exist on other planets. Dominic's success could kick-start a search for life on Mars. Recently, scientists have looked into other outer space locales. In 2019, China made space history as the first nation to ever land a probe on the far side of the moon. The science community lauded the accomplishment, but it turned out the Chinese had another bombshell to drop. Wu Yanhua, the deputy director of the China National Space Administration, opened up about their big plan. Detailing the purpose of the Chang'e 4 mission, he explained that his government was particularly interested about life on the moon. There weren't any humans aboard the spacecraft, but the scientific exploration phase did concern every man, woman, and child on Earth. They sent several types of organisms up there not just to survive, but to thrive. The animal kingdom was represented by a colony of fruit flies. Anyone who's ever found these pests in their home knows how persistent they can be. Still, the more intriguing part of this experiment hinged on a very different creature. The CSNA shot all kinds of plants up to the moon, except not in mature form. Instead, they focused on various types of seeds, ranging from potato to cotton plants, with the bold objective of growing crops on the moon. This decision raised immediate comparisons to the sci-fi flick The Martian. In one memorable sequence, Matt Damon's stranded astronaut character cultivated potatoes using his own excrement as fertilizer. Minus that gross ingredient, the Chinese had very similar aims. With pollution and climate change jeopardizing the sustainability of life on Earth, this trial could provide a viable alternative. If we could grow food on the moon, then it suddenly wouldn't be too hard to imagine settling there. With the spacecraft hurtling toward the moon, the mission was officially underway. Of course, the CSNA didn't just send a potted plant up into the airless vacuum of space. They had an arsenal of gadgets at their disposal. The seeds wouldn't enter the moon soil directly, but rather germinate in a biosphere. Inside, it would receive temperature-controlled air and a steady supply of water. It was a slam-dunk plan on paper at least. Once the probe completed its lunar landing, it deployed the biosphere. Cameras and scanners would monitor every development of the fly eggs and seeds, though some skeptics doubted they would make any strides. Were they right? The non-plant life the fruit fly eggs and a yeast colony fizzed almost immediately. From there, the Chinese scientists put all their hopes in their space garden. Over a week passed with no results. Given the ambitious nature of the plan, a failure to cultivate crops wouldn't be a huge loss, but still a disappointment. One detail, however, caught the entire agency by surprise after nine days. Though they'd planned it all along, the CSNA scientists still felt like they'd been struck by lightning when they saw the little sprout. The cottonseed was growing. They shared the news with the world right away. Their success wasn't limited to a single leaf either. Multiple cotton seedlings popped up out of the soil, becoming the first plants to grow in a specially designed box on the moon. Would China soon have enough cotton to make t-shirts for all their future moon colonists? They were ecstatic about their accomplishment and envisioned a monstrous amount of vegetation spreading across the satellite. However, they failed to foresee one complication. Even with the constant heat the biosphere provided, the temperature fluctuated wildly. The unrelenting cold of outer space proved to be a bigger problem than the CSNA realized. All of the cotton withered away. In the aftermath, the Chinese government diplomatically announced that this experiment had ended. The other objectives of Chang'e 4 went on. Still, experts around the world were energized by this fleeting success. Simon Gilroy, a botanist at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, recognized the experiment as a key step in sustaining life on the moon. It's fantastic to be able to sort of say, yeah, it's a first tiny step down that path, he said. After all, no one expected a few cotton plants alone to make a lunar colony possible. But these sprouts represented one large step for mankind, and very well may have secured our future. The Earth is in more danger than most people realize.
We know NASA best for launching astronauts and satellites into orbit. So would it surprise you to learn that a team of their scientists is studying models of a doomsday devastated New York City? This is no side project, either, they're deadly serious. The man behind this peculiar mission is Lindley Johnson. A 23-year veteran of the Air Force, he joined NASA's ranks in 2003. Ever since, his mind has mostly been fixated on the end of the world. But don't worry Lindley is no crackpot. He's not urging on the apocalypse, but rather approaching it from an analytical standpoint. Lindley serves as NASA's planetary defense officer, so nobody is better equipped to take on doomsday than he. While humanity does a pretty good job of endangering itself on a daily basis, Lindley doesn't worry about terrestrial threats. He's more concerned with space rocks. Granted, most meteorites that come down to Earth are pretty small, or even microscopic. However, what if an asteroid won multiple football fields in diameter was hurtling toward our planet? Odds are pretty good that it would land in the middle of the ocean, but Lindley wants more than luck on his side. That's why his NASA team investigates hypothetical cases of giant asteroids hitting densely urban areas. Thousands of years typically pass between such catastrophic events, but Lindley intends to be ready at any point. After all, Earth's geography proves just how destructive a collision can be. NASA certainly doesn't wish to see Midtown Manhattan turned into a crater, but they are interested in exactly how far that damage would spread. Lindley's team continually runs simulations to get a better idea of where asteroids are most likely to strike, plus what kind of damage we can expect. In some cases, a collision may be inevitable. But Earth isn't totally helpless. For years, Lindley and his colleagues were operating on a shoestring budget. Fortunately, a 2015 audit convinced Congress just how essential planetary defense could be. They immediately buffed up Lindley's annual spending power from $5 million to $50 million. With more resources on his side than he ever imagined, Lindley has led the charge against galactic peril. His NASA team assembled an arsenal of data and cutting-edge technology to keep asteroids at bay. NASA keeps this fact on the down low, but they've cataloged over 2,000 asteroids in our solar system, capable of obliterating an entire continent. Blowing up such a massive rock might cause too much fallout, so Lindley has other tricks up his sleeve. The most promising method to redirect an asteroid is through the use of kinetic impactors. These unmanned spacecraft would crash into an asteroid at high speed, thus deflecting it away from our planet. Think of it as a game of high-stakes billiards. With all due respect to fans of Armageddon, Lindley doesn't believe that landing on an asteroid would be the most effective solution. Still, NASA hasn't taken that option off the table. Astronauts have trained for complex asteroid landings, though nobody has ever attempted the feat. NASA foresees this operation more as a way to collect mineral samples, but there's always the chance they'll go full Michael Bay in an emergency. NASA has a selection of hypothetical fixes to choose from, though they're also ramping up their asteroid prevention in more concrete ways. For instance, they've installed more orbital telescopes to monitor any life-threatening space rocks in the solar system. The capability to spot catastrophe coming could be the most important factor in the end. Most deflection techniques require months or years to mobilize, so a few days' notice won't help at all. The good news is that NASA isn't alone in this fight. Lindley's team ran exercises with FEMA the Federal Emergency Management Agency to prepare for collateral damage from a collision. They are a great way for us to learn how to work together and meet each other's needs, Lindley explained. In 2019, Lindley also organized a conference with the European Space Agency and the International Asteroid Warning Network. Working together, they'll have eyes on the sky all over the world. While it seems unlikely that we'll have to deal with an impending apocalypse, civilization is better prepared than ever. That news will only disappoint doomsday preppers, who may very well have stocked up their bunkers for nothing. In spite of the life-or-death consequences of his job, Lindley says he sleeps just fine at night. It's just another day at NASA. Besides, Lindley can name plenty of colleagues who have responsibilities that might be even more trying than his own. Lindley likely couldn't handle George Aldrich's job. When George's teacher told him to shoot for the stars as a child, he took that advice pretty literally. 
Fast forward several decades, and he's caught way more than just a whiff of success at NASA. Growing up in New Mexico, George watched his dad fly up the Navy ranks and join the coveted Blue Angels. He always dreamed of reaching such soaring heights, and so he looked for a heroic job as soon as he finished high school. George started a bit smaller. He volunteered for the local fire department, and his recent chemistry and mathematics experience piqued the interest of the chief. He signed up George for a special task on the force. While he didn't extinguish many infernos, George stood out on the department's odor panel. By training his sense of smell, he could sense problems like gas leaks before they had a chance to ignite. Soon, George realized he was meant for bigger and better things. In 1974, his chief recommended that George take his talents to the next level. NASA had a firm presence in the area, so perhaps, George figured, he could secure a position there. At the same time, not just anybody could waltz in and apply to be an astronaut. After the Apollo 1 disaster in which a technical function aboard a shuttle killed all three crew members aboard NASA was taking safety seriously. They needed staff who could prevent disasters most people would never see coming. After sending in his application, George had to take a strenuous exam to see if he was made of the right stuff. Hours later, he set his pencil down and headed home, waiting for a phone call that would make or break his dreams. Then the good news came in. NASA told George to report to the White Sands Test Facility immediately, where he would begin his new role as a chemical specialist. But what exactly did that mean? Well, if you ask George about his job, he would describe himself as an asalnaut or the chief sniffer. That's because his real responsibilities boil down to smelling anything that NASA sends into space. Odd as it sounds, George's role makes sense. Astronauts go into space for long periods of time, stuck in close quarters, breathing in recirculated air. The last thing command wants is any harmful odors or substances traveling along with them, smelling up the shuttle. That's precisely where George and his team come in. They personally inspect the smell of every piece of cargo and gear to make sure everything is ship shape. Of course, nobody has been sniffing for longer than George. He holds the NASA record for the most official sniffs, with his number approaching 1,000. Naturally, George's system is more nuanced than just judging a scent as good or bad. The odor panel blindly scrutinizes each object, so their everyday conceptions about the items won't cloud their judgment. From there, the sniffers rank everything on a scale from 0 to 4. If something scores higher than 2.5, they suggest leaving it on Earth. Between tests, George might cleanse his palate, so to speak, using a trick developed by perfumers. He simply resets his nostrils by smelling the back of his own hand, which is sometimes called going home. And his work has likely saved lives. A manned space mission involves so many complex chemical reactions that NASA cannot risk any toxic materials sneaking aboard. The astronauts themselves may not be able to detect it, so they require an expert nose to do it for them and more. Much of the time, the most problematic materials aren't what you would expect. George has found that old-fashioned camera film, for example, can be surprisingly toxic. Meanwhile, other items can just get downright disgusting. Something as basic as Velcro can stink up an entire space shuttle. George once determined that while separate Velcro straps have no real odor, together they can produce an unbearably pungent smell. But not every scent can be swept away. George says that when it comes down to it, humans really stink, and there's not much NASA can do about it. Because of basic functions like sweating and going to the bathroom, astronauts need to learn to live with a little odor. After 44 years, George is still going strong. He estimates that he's only ever missed two tests due to sickness over his entire career. You could say he wrote the book on odor testing, and he's definitely smelled that book as well. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to like and subscribe.